Hello friends, welcome to my channel Soulful Spinning. This is my little creative channel on YouTube where I share my adventures in fiber and other creative pursuits, mainly knitting and spinning with a he heavy emphasis on uh, fleece preparation and spinning wool. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the Perindale breed, which is a breed that developed in the 20th century to meet a certain need. So I'll get into the Perindale breed. It is the eighth of a series of uh, episodes that I'm doing discussing various breeds from around the world. Sometime before Christmas, I purchased a Hearthside Fiber sampler box with 12 breeds, and I thought it might be fun to take a deep dive into each of the breeds, spin the little 25 gram sample, and knit something out of it. I am knitting the Berlin Blanket by Kate Davies, and it is a modular blanket that has sort of a, a leaf motif. And so with every sample, I'm creating another square and in the hopes that someday down the line it will become a part of a larger project. Today is the 17th of February, 2023, if I haven't mentioned that before. And my name is Lisa. And I can be reached uh, via email at soulfulspinning at gmail.com. You can also uh, contact me through Instagram where I am the Soulful Spinner. I'm not too active on Ravelry. I do check occasionally. So if you do use Ravelry and you want to send me a PM there, I do get your messages there as well. So yeah, please feel free to reach out. I love to hear from you. And that is the main reason for the channel is just to make connections with the wider community. In today's episode, we're going to talk about Perindale. It's the breed of the week. I'm going to give you a little update on my Lopa Pesa sweater that I finished last week, but I just actually blocked it this week, and I made a matching hat to go with it, so I thought I would share that with you today. And then from my bookshelf, I'm going to uh, review a, a, a huge textbook-type tome, and this is The Principles of Knitting by June uh, Hemmons Hyatt. So if you stay tuned to the end of the video, that'll be the last segment. All right, let's get into the breed of the week because this one was uh, a totally new breed to me. I, I had never worked with Perindale before and I really didn't know very much about it at all. So I ha have done some research online. There's a couple of um, websites that I got a lot of information. And then of course, I'll share what the Fleece and Fiber source book has to say about Perindale. And again, I can't uh, sing the praises of this book enough uh, you're hearing about it a lot from a lot of podcasters, and yeah, I'm happy to see a lot of new spinning-oriented um, content that I'm seeing from a lot of podcasters. So it looks like a lot of younger women, mainly, and men, are getting into the craft, which is super exciting. All right, so what is, what is Perindale? So Perindale is actually named after a gentleman named Jeffrey Perindale, Perrin who has kind of a fascinating life story, which I'm going to share a little bit with you today. So the Perindale breed uh, is originally from New Zealand, and it was first bred by Jeffrey Perrin of Massey University in New Zealand. And it was out of a response um, to get sheep that could thrive in the varying conditions of, of the countryside that, that was at the time. It was developed in 1956. It proved successful on dry hill country as much as on fertile plains. And it gradually replaced the traditional breeds in part of the high country. So the Perindale was a cross between border Cheviot rams and Romney ewes. So Romneys were introduced to New Zealand in 1853 and by the 1930s, it was the dominant breed in New Zealand. But what had happened is due to overgrazing, a lot of the fertility of the soils across New Zealand's hill country declined. And so these, these Romney, which are originally from the Romney, um, Romney Marsh in, in Britain, uh, were not doing as well as they had. So the vegetation there had reverted to weeds and scrubs, and so they were looking to get a hardier sheep that could thrive in those conditions. And so the Border Cheviot is one of those hill breeds that is very 
uh, sturdy, hardy, can survive on sparse vegetation, and they have a lot of uh, very good qualities that the breeders at this time wanted to uh, incorporate. So they they worked with the border Cheviot rams and the Romney ewes until, after many years of selective breeding, they developed the breed. So it uh, is, has excellent fertility, it's easy care lambing, um, the ewes are good mothers, uh, the lambs are very uh, prone to survival, they're parasite resistant, uh, the meat quality is good, and they actually have a very, very nice fleece as well. Now I have never worked with the raw Perindale locks before, which I'll try to remedy in the future. Um, all that I had to work from is a 25 gram sample, which I have here, of comb top from, um, from the box. So what else? So yes, it's dubbed a sheep for all environments. So it, it does very well in a wide variety of uh, environments. So they said some of the, I read that some of the Perindales can have more of a Cheviot appearance and some have more of a Romney appearance. In terms of the fleece, the fleece staple is five to six inches. The micron is 32 to 35. And just for comparison, the, the Cheviots have a micron of 27 to 33. And the Romney, which is a long wool, has a micron of 32 to 39. And so the Perindales run between 32 and 35. So sort of smack dab in sort of a medium a range. Lamb fleeces can be next to skin soft. It has a clear, even crimp. It's open and has moderate luster. two piles, about 12-ish grams each. And these two beautiful spindles from Steve Paulson and Connie over at Spindlewood Spindles.
applied this last night on my on one of my bigger spindles while we're watching television. And I, oh, I like the play of the spindle. It's a nice, pretty, pretty yarn. So here's the card. From Earthside Fibers. I saved a lock and um, I measured it. It's about it's about five inches, I would say. I have a little uh, sample here. The breed origin is New Zealand, staple length, three, it, she says three to five inches, uh, micron 28 to 33. It's interesting about micron. Um, I don't think that micron in and of itself is a super definitive measurement of how it's gonna feel next to your skin. There's a lot of other factors that, that, that come into how a fleece is going to feel and how it's going to behave. So just because something has a little higher micron, you know, you don't discount that as a possible uh, wool for you to use for, you know, various purposes. All right, so what I was going to do next is talk about what Deb Robeson says in the Fleece and Fiber Source book about Perrindale. She has it in, in the other category so the fleece and fiber source book is uh, separated by types. And if you go to Amazon or a, another bookseller, you can, you can have a look inside the book and get an idea of what's in there. But she has this in the other sheep breeds. And let's see, so Perrindale, which I thought I had bookmarked, is on page 287. So uh, she just reiterates, reiterates what I just said before. It was developed in the 1950s, etc. Uh, they're, she says they are long wool animals that do well in cold and wet climates. However, she didn't put it in the long wool chapter in the book. You know, maybe because it's a cross. Perrindale is a bouncy wool which will spin up with a spring to it as opposed to the compact sleekness of other mostly English long wools. The lofty quality can add warmth to sweaters and cushioning qualities for rugs. There are both finer and coarser ranges within the breed, and the New Zealand standards have moved toward the coarse end of the scale lately in response to market demands and husbandry realities. Thus, some sheep are producing wool for general knitting yarns, while others grow fleeces best suited for harder wearing textiles like rugs, bags, and upholstery. They are generally white, although there are colored flocks. That's probably because of the Romney genetics. Romneys can be grays and blacks and browns. The fleece will take color well. The long staples immediately suggest spinning from the lock, flicking or combing, or the, although the shorter staples, sometimes cut in half, you can card. Fiber tends to capture air and bounce, so even full worsted spinning will give you loft in the finished yarn, which is something that I actually found in my spinning which I'll share with you in just a moment. So yeah, let's talk about my spinning and the sample that I made, and then I'll give you a little bit of information about Jeffrey Perrin, who, uh, yeah, but well, I'll do a little research on his life, and, and he sort of is, was, is a, remarkable, a remarkable person. So, I'm gonna stand up here to show you my square. Um, my squares are not blocked. This is just a fresh off the needles. But one thing that struck me right away is how white the fleece was. A lot of white fleeces tend to be more on a creamy color or more yellow, warm white. And I found this to be uh, quite white, um, actually very close to uh, this wool, which I'm working with, uh, I'll share with this. This is some Corridale that I've been working with. It's the whitest. Uh, wool I've ever worked with. Uh, here's got quite a bit of the sample left. I spun it with a short forward draw in a true worsted style. Um, I'm putting little tags 
on my squares and then later on I'm going to sew a label on the back of each of the squares so I know uh, what I have here. Um, I was pleasantly surprised how beautiful uh, this this knit up into it. It reminds me a little bit of my Romney square, which I'll pull out actually in a minute and you can do a comparison. But yes, very, uh, a nice handle, not, you know, you wouldn't say it was um, next to skin soft, not like Merino, but I think this would um, make a beautiful sweater. I know I always say that, make a beautiful sweater. Here, I'll put it on my shirt here. Um, oops, <laughs> it would make a beautiful sweater. I also think in the two-ply, um, I really like it in the lace. Can you see that? I haven't even blocked this. And it's really, um, oops, I've got it backwards. It's really showing uh, the lace quite well. And what I noticed about the yarn is it has that, um, sometimes when you spin a long wool worsted, you get these, like they look like little pearls along the, the length of the, of the yarn. And I worsted uh, spun this on two of my drop spindles. I use these two. These two are, are spindle wood spindles. And I usually ply my samples on my wheel, but uh, we were watching TV, we were watching a really bad movie last night, but, <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me, but I just decided that I would just ply it on uh, one of my bigger drop spindles. I think I used this one here, I'll get it for you. That's my, if you hear something in the background, that's my dishwasher. I plied it on this guy here, which is the Cherry Kundert spindle. My, actually, my very first spindle, my uh, gateway drug to spindles. <laughs> couldn't get to the store to buy some flowers, so I have a bouquet of uh, spindles back here for your viewing pleasure. Okay, so what was I saying? So yeah, um, I'm going to grab the, I'm going to grab the Romney, I'm going to grab the Romney square, I think this is the Romney square. So just for comparison, oh, wow, it's really a sunny day today, so you're going to have some variation in light here. Um, this is the Romney square, and this is the Perindale. And uh, the Romney has quite a bit more luster, but it was very similar in the handling and the spinning. I think Perindale would be a, a lovely first uh, wool for a new spinner because it has a, a decent staple length and it was really easy to spin. So yeah. So yeah, my preference is to um, work from raw wool, but um, I'm just working with what was available to me and um, enjoying the, the little process. Every week I spin up a new breed I do some research and I, I create a little square. It's very satisfying. And the squares are going way faster now since I have the pattern really down. So yeah, so I would definitely recommend Perindale for uh, weaving. I think it would be a great warp, uh, would be a great outerwear yarn, uh, make a nice uh, durable jumper, cardigan, uh, probably even socks if you mix it with maybe a mohair or an alpaca or a nylon or something like that. So yes, I was trying to get some more information uh, about the breed and in the course of doing so, I uh, found some information about Jeffrey Perrin who is the, credited with the development of the breed and, and actually takes its name. So who was Jeffrey Perrin? Um, Jeffrey Perrin was born the 30th of November 1892 and died the 19th of July 1980. So he lived for, to a ripe old age of 87 years. He was born in England, emigrated to Canada as a teen. I think he was a quite young, 14 or 15. Uh, came to Canada and worked on farms and orchards. 
And I read that he loved nature. He was very interested in agriculture and science in the natural world. He attended the Ontario Agricultural College on a scholarship. Of course, if you think about his years, 1892 to 1980, you, you know, of course, you naturally think of the two world wars, which he actually served in both. He served in the Canadian Army, the British Army, and the New Zealand military forces in the First and the Second World Wars. So, wow, you know, he's somebody that, uh, you know, fought in two world wars and lived to tell the tale. He rose to the rank of brigadier. In 1915, he served on the Western Front and received the French Croix de Guerre with Star. I hope I said that correctly. Among other honors, he became a Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire for services to agriculture, especially head of Massey Agricultural College. So don't know a ton about Massey College in New Zealand, but he played a leading role in the negotiations for purchasing the land and forming the college. So he was an agricultural scientist, a university professor. He was the principal of the school. He was a soldier in two world wars, and he played a leading role in negotiations for land and purchase and formation of the college. So really lived a full life and contributed a lot to his country and to uh, agriculture. And of course, we have Perrindale Wool, which is named after Jeffrey Perrin. So I thought that was kind of kind of cool. I had um, uh, my grandfather uh, came immigrated emigrated to the states when he was just 13 or 14, and he came from Croatia, and he served in World War One, and then my father, Edward. He served in the Navy in World War II. He was right out of high school. He was just 18 and was in World War II and served on LST ships. And uh, he was at Iwo Jima. And so anytime I read about uh, the, the people that had served in those wars and survived, um, it just, I don't know, it just speaks to my, my heart, you know. So, so yes, so God bless Jeffrey Perrin and his descendants. All right, so that's everything I found out about Perrindale wool uh, and more. All right, I just have two more things to, to share with you today. So last week I shared with you this sweater that I completed. This is my Lopa Pesa, uh, whoopsie, <laughs> some of the wool, wool got stuck. I swear this Icelandic is like Velcro. I mean, you can... You can like stick stuff on it. <laughs> so this is my sweater. I'm going to actually uh, put it on for you today and, and show you what it looks like on and maybe even go outside and show you some pictures.
You ready to do some editing? But I wanted to share this with you uh, another week because I washed it. I, I washed it with some eucalyptus, uh, got it fully soaked for some hours, and then uh, took it out, uh, wrapped it up in a towel, and then and then dried it. And it really, it, it changed. You know, the fabric characteristic changed slightly in the wash. Uh, firstly, the rose heather color um, did a slight bleed in the water, um, but didn't obviously didn't do anything to the white. But the whole the whole piece is a lot more cohesive now. It's very very soft. Well, soft. You know, no, I wouldn't necessarily wear this without anything underneath, but it's surprisingly comfortable to wear. It's very lightweight. I did the folded collar for it. I know you saw this last week if you looked at my at last week's video, but I wanted to have a matching hat, and so this is the hat that I made. I used a free pattern for the numbers on Ravelry. It's called the, the Warm Hat, and I can't remember the designer's name, but it's a free pattern. It comes in two different sizes. And for the motif around here, I just used a motif out of my Scandinavian Motifs book by Mary, Mary J. Mus Mucklestone. So just use this chart here. Um, highly recommend this book if you're interested in creating any of your own patterns. Uh, cast on 64 stitches. I think I misspoke last week. And then um, my husband says, oh, you should put a pom-pom on it. And uh, this is an alpaca pom-pom that I purchased uh, some years ago. And it was just uh, hanging around. I never had used it before, so I, I put that on. Uh, this, this has not been blocked yet, so I don't know. I'm going to have to block it without the pom-pom in there. But let me just put it on for you. I feel like I'm ready for the ski slopes, you guys. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and put on my sweater. Okay, so there's no front and back, no, no short rows or anything like that. Now my microphone might make a little bit of noise, so do forgive me for that. Let's see, come back here. So here's my sweater. My microphone's there, okay. Yeah, so here's my mic. So yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready for the slopes, you guys. <laughs> so yeah, so here I am. Um, I got a matching outfit now. So uh, I made the size medium. This is Lurifax Frost. The designer is True Benstop. Yeah, I made the medium size, and I knit it. I knit the whole body on a US nine, which is a 4.5 millimeter needle, and then I did all the ribbing here, here, here in the bottom, on a US seven, which is a 4.5, and then I did the same thing with the hat. Cast on 64 stitches, did a two by two rib, and then I just found a pattern in the book that had a 64 stitch or uh, 8 stitch repeat and um, this still needs to be blocked but yeah so uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how much use I'm going to get out of it I'm not that much of an outdoorsy girl but you know I'm ready I'm, I'm ready to go um, go skiing or whatever <laughs> so yeah so the next one I'm going to make the next Lopa Pesa type thing I'm going to make is going to be a cardigan and it's going to be a zip up cardigan so I could use it as a jacket and I think it'd have a lot more use for me in my wardrobe. But uh, yeah, I'm kind of chuffed that I, uh, I finished and it's like a successful uh, knit. It's something that fits me and something that I could, I could wear. Okay, now I really have to take this off. But yeah, just one last look here. Let me step back. You can see the, see. Uh, 
All right. Let's take this off here. Oh, you want to see the inside here? I caught as few floats as possible. Of course, now I have, I have uh, Icelandic fibers all over my black shirt. <laughs> see here, yep, fine, okay. Yeah, so here are the floats. I, I, I caught the floats as little as possible. Uh, reasoning that uh, once it's washed and worn, uh, all these floats are going to get sort of felted in, uh, fold in, and they're not going to get uh, caught on anything. So, so yeah, I thought you guys might uh, find it um, interesting to see the sweater blocked and worn. All right. So I just have one more thing I want to share with you today, and that is from my bookshelf. So last week I was talking about how I had purchased a knitting belt. So I bought this knitting belt from a maker on Etsy. Her name is Lorna. I don't remember her name, but I'll put her name right here uh, in a little subtitle. Because I was interested in, um, you know, I'm always interested in different ways to knit, you know, maybe ways that would be more ergonomic, uh, you know, uh, a variety. It's nice to have a variety of ways to knit. Just, you know, maybe you have an injury or maybe you just find one more comfortable than another. So a viewer uh, mentioned that June Hemmons Hyatt in her Principles of Knitting uh, talked about the knitting belt, and actually, June talks about everything in this book. So this is my from the from my shelf selection for this week. I actually uh, bought this book, uh, gosh, a really long time ago, and it's been sitting on my shelf. I'm just going as I'm talking here. I'm going to show you the contents. Yeah, show you the contents. You could read that if you'd like. So I purchased this, I think, when I was a fairly new knitter. It, this is the second edition of the book. It was published in 2012. Yeah, so the original book was published in 1988. And I read that it became so popular that there was a high demand for the book, but it had gone out of print. It was ridiculous to buy used, like they were charging hundreds of dollars or something to buy this book. And so June was sort of not pressured, but she was encouraged to come out with a second edition of the book. And in her introduction, she says that the original sort of uh, manuscript or physical product to print the book was no longer available. And so she she retyped the entire book. And in the course of doing so, she uh, revised and edited. I think the reason I didn't use this book very much is it's kind of intimidated. It, it reminds me of a college textbook, which it kind of is. I mean, it's $50. I think it's $45. But uh, if you want to know anything about knitting, this is the book for you. I. I was, it's kind of gobsmacked by the amount of information in here. In the introduction, she tells you how to use the book. Uh, and I'm just going to read you this paragraph to get an idea of how you could use the book. This book, it does not simply provide instructions for how to do a technique with the expectation that you would learn in a rote fashion but instead it provides the knowledge you need to truly master the craft. Therefore, each technique is explained, how it works, 
what its characteristics are, how it can be expected to behave in the fabric, and how it compares to other similar techniques. So it's extremely uh, comprehensive. She says it's for uh, beginners as well as experienced knitters. She encourages you to read the, uh, the, the chapter on stitch gauge is one of the most important ones. She has a chapter on fibers and yarns. She talks all about wool, cotton, viscose, mohair, etc. She has a chapter on blocking your knits. Uh, I mean, really, anything you'd want to know about knitting is in this book. I was particularly interested in chapter one, which is all about knitting methods. And she has some really uh, very good illustrations in the, the book. And really she talks about the pros and cons of the different methods. You know, so she has the right-handed method, which she distinguishes between right finger methods. So you know, she really gets into the, the details of the mechanics of knitting. And then she has a little blurb about the knitting belt, which is the thing that I'm particularly interested in. And it, it's very authoritative in, in, in tone, but at the same time, she invites the reader to, uh, you know, for themselves to learn the different techniques and to make sense of it for themselves. And so she's, you know, really empowering knitters uh, through this book. And I mean, it's, what an accomplishment. I mean, just you name it, you send me a question and I will tell you what page to go to because it just has everything in it, everything. So yeah, I thought it was this whole little segment that I've, I've started doing in my, on my channel has really given me a newfound appreciation for a lot of the books that I already own. And if you can pick up a copy of this, um, I, I bet now you could get uh, a copy of this from like thrift books uh, for a lot less than the list price um, since it was, was printed a second time. So I highly recommend The Principles of Knitting by June Hemmons Hyatt. Have you, do you have this book in your library? And if so, what do you think of it? I'd, I'd love to hear your opinions below. And any books that you have that you really feel are important, that you really love, that, you, that you'd like to share with the rest of us in the comments, uh, I really appreciate that. I'm always looking for uh, new books to add to my shelf. So please do let me know what your favorite knitting books are. All right, so yeah, I said this would be a shorter episode and I think I succeeded. Uh, I think that's all I have for you. Um, other than the ongoing breed study, which you're probably getting tired of by now, but hey, there's like four more, so hang in there. And then the other thing I've been doing is making bats. I've been making uh, Coradale, Coradale bats with just a touch of Angora. Yeah, I want to make some socks out of this. So uh, that's been a joy working with my drum carter again. So soft. All right, friends, I hope this uh, you found this episode informative and or enjoyable. And as always, please do connect with me down in the comments. I'd love to hear from you and, let, and find out how you're doing. Next week, we'll talk about Targhee. And uh, yeah, that's about all I have for you today. So uh, take care, friends. Have a great week, and we'll see you real soon. Bye for now.